لانه في صوت هواء في حدا قاعد قاعد بمكان في ويند ويندي دكتور صفوان دكتور صفوان شكله في هواء بال دكتور صفوان على البحر I think we need to check that because it's just uh, make noise. Up. Yeah, background noise. أعتقد إحنا المفروض إن كلنا نعمل أميوت أحسن. كلنا نعمل ميوت أس. Yeah. دكتور مازن Dr. Mazen, can you hear us? I think he he's disconnected, Dr. Hussam. I think you can take over. Yeah, I think it's a good good evening or good afternoon for everyone. And really, we're going to start ocular surface disease session uh, on behalf of Dr. <laughs> Mazen and Dr. Safwan. Uh, basically, will will be the first talk will be Dr. Hussain. It will be dry eye disease. What are we heading for? So Dr. Hassan, it's uh, nice to have you with us today. And you can share your screen, please. Sure. In this scientific webinar, uh, scientific conference. You have my PowerPoint, my slides?
Yes, we can see your slides. Thank you so much. Uh, my uh, talk is about the dry eye disease. What are we heading uh, for? I have no any conflict of interest. So as a first uh, um, point, I want to ask the question, why is the dry eye disease challenging? That we know because of the lack of correlation between sign and symptom between the dry eye patient, this is a challenge about the complex etiology, limited number of US food and drug administration, and accurate treatment option, and also potential progressive nature of this disease and poor patient company. Because of all of these reasons, dry eye disease is a challenge. And whenever uh, we want to have a good practice in dry eye, we should have a, a simple and practical definition regarding to the dry eye. And also, uh, we should uh, need a straightforward classification. And based on this classification and subclassification, we can go to the treatment. And because of all of these, we should uh, achieving a differential diagnosis and classification into a specification. This is a state subtype and go to a directed individual treatment approach. Sorry, I have a problem with. I know you know about this uh, lacrimal functional unit is comprises of ocular surface. Uh, I mean, uh, it's composed of the cornea, conjunctiva, meibomian gland, and also main and accessory uh, lacrimal glands and the neural network that connect these uh, components together. And whenever we have uh, the disturbance in any component of this unit uh, we have a dry eye disease. As another uh, interesting unit is ocular surface microenvironment components that uh, these environments also have uh, components of lacrimal functional unit and as well as, well as other components like, uh, such as uh, some small molecules, vitamins and also matrix immune cells and the microbiome in this microenvironment and damage to any of these components can create and make it dry eye disease. Let me have a historical overview of definition of dry eye disease. So you can, uh, the first diagnosis, uh, the first definition was uh, proposed at uh, 1903 by Schirmer, then by Shugren, and uh, NEI presented the first uh, definition of the RIA at 1995, the RIA disease is a disorder of the TRP due to tear deficiency or excessive evaporation, which causes damage to the intercapular ocular surface and is associated with symptom of ocular discomfort. It was the, uh, it was a very big, uh, uh, solid beginning for the consensus of the RIA definition. Japanese Society of the RIA also presented uh, another definition in 1995 and also again in uh, 2006. And based on this definition, the eye disease is a chronic disease of the tear fluid and keratokines and epithelium that does result from uh, various factors and, and accompanies ophthalmic discomfort and abnormal visual function. The uh, criteria, diagnostic criteria based on this definition were assessment of symptom and also doing some uh, diagnostic test and based on the result of this evaluation, they established the uh, definition of dry eye. And this figure shows the Japanese uh, definition about the dry eye, the definite uh, dry eye and probable dry eye based on the result of the evaluation of the symptom and some test of ocular evaluation. And also, we have another uh, panel by Delphi panel on 2006. And based on the changes of this uh, compartment leads, tear field, conjunctiva, cornea, and vision, they put the patient in the core level of severity. And also, this functional tear syndrome panel also introduced another definition and classification, and they put the patient in the, into the these uh, four categories: refuse deficient, evaporative, doublet cell deficiency, and exposure related dysfunctional tear syndrome. And that is also shows the ODC European consensus and also based on the combination of symptom and some ocular test, they divided the patient in some scenario and some subclassification. And dry eye workshop, uh, that is a collection and meeting of experts in dry eye in the world, presented two definitions at 2007 and 2017. 
And based on the last definition, ear film instability, hyperosmolarity, ocular inflammation, and like sensory abnormality play etiologic roles, and we should consider them when we want to evaluate the patient with a dry eye disease. And Asian dry eye society also presented another definition for dry eye based on an you mentioned that dry eye disease is a multifactorial. All of this uh, definition emphasize on the multifactoriality of the disease of dry eye. And based on this definition, dry eye characterized by unstable tear film, uh, causing a variety of symptoms and a visual impairment, potentially accompanied by ocular surface tension. They emphasize only on the combination of symptoms that are evaluated by the some special questionnaire and also unstable TLP. They introduce the term of short TBUT as a very important variable in dry eye disease. And about the classification, we have also a different classification, any eye classification, Morabi at 2005, based on the etiopathogenesis, uh, they put the patient in this 10 category and also Delphi classification, dry eye workshop 2007 classification. They divide the dry eye patient into two main category, ACUS and evaporative, and sub classify at different groups, uh, such as children syndrome and non children in the ACUS deficient type, and introducing and experiencing evaporative in the evaporative uh, category. And is the last. Uh, classification that presented by uh, dry eye workshop at uh, 2070 and based on this classification and evaluation of the symptoms and sign they put the patient in the different classification eventually they put the patient in three categories acute sufficient evaporated and mixed and two-thirds of the patient are in the mixed and evaporated uh, category and it's also an asian dry eye a society classification was presented at 2020 and they put the patient in the three main categories acus deficient, again evaporative, and also decreased wet ability dry eye that refer to the problems in the missing layer of the of the TFP. And about the diagnosis, I only uh, we had one minute more about Dr. Hassan. He shows the uh, diagnosis test. The combination of symptoms and some uh, tests uh, and some signs to establish the diagnosis and divide the patient into the two categories. And you should get all of this information when you want to evaluate the patient with dry eyes. Some of these tests can be done by technicians such as visual acuity, visual acuity, refraction evaluation, and also measurement of terrestriality and also. Uh, measurement of a person's self inflammatory can be evaluated by the technician, and we need some more additional evaluation that was done by clinicians, such as evaluation by this. Dr. Hussein, we ran out of time, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. And this shows the uh, pattern of the theory of time, uh, line or area pattern in acute sufficient, random type in lipid deficient, and it is with a uh, spot or dimple pattern and it is with ability. It's a very important uh, sign for evaluating the patient with dry eye. This figure shows the different pattern of the corrosion staining, residential staining. And uh, if we need to uh, do additional assessment, we can use when measure the pronoun sensation to pronoun photography, especially in patient with decreased vision and variation in his or her vision. And TRP imaging, use of OCT, mabography, interferometry, measurement of some uh, serum antibody biomarker uh, like SSA or SSP, especially children uh, patients, and also uh, getting the culture from ocular surface. Dr. Hassan, I'm sorry, I need to terminate here a little bit. Sorry for that, because they really were running out of time, okay? Otherwise, there's no time for other speakers. Okay, okay. Sorry for that. You can conclude, please, if you want. Yeah, yeah. In conclusion, and based on this evaluation, we have a different approach to a patient. We should uh, treatment of acute deficient dry eye with a different uh, agent, and also we can use a different uh, modality for treating the patient with evaporative dry eye. And in conclusion, and there are also emerging. Uh, 
measurement and averaging treatment for the eye, such as nasal nerve stimulation and also probing of the neuronal gland and neuropathic pain and uh, treatment of centralized pain by using of some special medicine and also nerve block for acupuncture. And about the take home message following talking mention of the dry eye diagnosis, it should also determine severity and also a theological subtype for getting a good treatment. And in summary, management of dry eye is an art and you should not obey only from the sun guidelines. And in the conclusion, customize and personalize therapy targeting the ocular surface microenvironment with aid in complete resolution of dry eye diseases. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussain. Thank you very much. That uh, comprehensive, but it was too long. Sorry for the time. It's a bit short. Uh, I'll leave it to Dr. Mazin to introduce the next speaker. He's back again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Osama. Uh, I'd like to invite the next speaker, who is Dr. Khalid Aish, please, to uh, talk about impact of dry eye disease on epithelial map. Dr. Khalid, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to start this lecture. You are the best to present this lecture, Dr. Khalid. Thanks. I will be talking, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, I will be talking about the impact of dry eye disease on epithelial uh, mapping. Uh, as Dr. Hussain mentioned, there are a lot of classification or a lot of definitions for uh, we cannot dry eye. See, we cannot see your, uh, your screen, Dr. Khalid. Oops. Did you share? Or the Dr. Hussain, he stopped sharing? Yeah, Dr. Hussain, would you please stop sharing? Yeah, now we can see your screen, Dr. Khalid. Go on, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, as Dr. Hussain mentioned, a lot of class, lot of definitions of dry eye disease. One of the uh, new class, uh, new definition is uh, uh, under the uh, Tear Film Ocular Service DS2 report, which defined disease as a multifactorial disease. So this definition implies that the diagnosis of a dry eye is a complex one and requires different aspects of the tear film to be assessed using different diagnostic modalities. And one of these diagnostic modalities is the, uh, is using the uh, uh, scanning of the, sc I can't forward my, okay, there is a delay in the, in the proceed okay uh, the impact of dry eye on refractive and cataract patients it leads to poor uh, vision equality in the proof study they uh, mentioned that despite 66 visual acuity 50 percent of dry eye disease are complaining of blurry vision compared to only 14 percent of the control so it can affect has give effect on uh, vision, had effect on corneal topography, uh, can lead to refractive surprises. This subject will be covered by Dr. Ahmed, I think. And also it can prolong the recovery period in post-operative patients. So we will be talking about topography and tomography, epithelial mapping, and uh, the repeatability of the measurements and uh, the effect of dry eye on apparitions. So in step, steps in reading topography and tomography, as we all know, we need to look at the Myers, and this uh, step gives us a clue about what is going on if we find that there are irregular rings or there are broken rings. This is a, a clue that this patient could have a dry eye disease. Also, if the uh, second step is to look at the quality of the scans, if we find that the patient is not cooperative, he can't blink or he can't open his eyes, uh, can't fix it uh, uh, well, this might indicate that this patient could have a dry eye disease. Also, if you look at the, at the scans, we can find areas that are missing, that are not covered by the, the topography. All these are clues of uh, dry eye disease. Also, if we look at the elevation maps, we can, we can find surface irregularities, we can find irregular astigmatism, if we see like this, areas of flat spots, another areas of hot spots, 
this is also another clue of dry eye disease. So it's very important here to differentiate uh, if we have a focal bulge, an area of focal bulge, whether this area of bulge is due to dry eye disease or due to uh, ocular service or due to uh, ectasia. As we all know, if we the differential diagnosis of irregular astigmatism or irregular surface on the topography could be due to ocular surface disease or could be due to corneal pathology or could be a real ectatic corneal disease. And this I will be focusing on the how to differentiate ocular surface disease from the ectatic pathologies. Because these irregularities can lead to light scattering, will increase the higher order operations, it will lead to image distortion, and all this will affect the quality of vision. So the next step when evaluating a corneal topography is to look at the posterior surface. If we see this area, the upper, uh, the upper scans, if we look at the posterior surface, we can find that the posterior surface is completely normal, while in the lower uh, scans, we can find that there is a corresponding area of posterior bulge, which indicates that, that the lower scan could be due to uh, ectatic disease while the upper surface are due, the upper, the upper scans are due to ocular surface disease. And also, if you look at the, the, the area of irregularities, we can find here in the upper scan that it's ill-defined. Uh, also, it's reaching almost to the tip, to the tip of the scans, while in the lower one, it's more uh, focal and more uh, rounded and not reaching to the periphery. And this is another clue how to differentiate whether this is due to dry eye disease or to uh, ectatic disease. Uh, another very important tool nowadays in differentiating these abnormalities is the use of the epithelial mapping. First, we need to know what is what are the normal epithelial thickness in order to study the epithelial mapping. As we all know that the lower uh, half of the epithelium usually thicker than the upper half. And also we need to look at the color scales because it's completely the opposite of what we used to uh, understand from the corneal tomographies where the blue colors, the uh, white colors reflects a thicker cornea while in the epithelial mapping, the blue colors reflect a thinner epithelium and vice versa when we see the red colors, it reflects a thicker epithelium rather than a thin a cornea. So we need to keep this in mind when looking at the uh, scans. So if we face a patient with this area of focal bulge, if we go to the epithelial mapping, what we can see that there is epithelial modeling in areas where the, uh, the eye is dry. And this is, uh, if we look at the total thickness of the cornea, we can, we, it will not help us any, anymore. But if we look at the epithelial mapping, we can find that there is areas of epithelial hyperplasia as seen here, that the epithelium is much thicker. And if we plot this against the standard coloring, we can find how thick is this area in the epithelium. And this is usually in the areas in mild dry eye disease. While in cases of ectatic corneal disease, we usually see that the areas in the area of the bulge are usually thinner. The epithelium will be seen thinner. So this is another important way to differentiate these abnormalities on the uh, that we usually face or see on, uh, on tomography machine. Uh, but, and the, the nice thing about these uh, epithelial changes that they are reversible once the eye is treated uh, with lubricants and all modalities of treatment and dry eye resolved, these epithelial hyperplasia usually returns back to normal, but this takes uh, usually a few months. Uh, in a severe dry eye, the picture is completely different where we get uh, a thinner epithelium, the, the, the epithelium get thinner and thinner in a very severe advanced stage of dry eye. And this bring out uh, a lot of reports to, to classify dry eye disease based on epithelial mapping, where in mild dry eye disease, we can find areas of epithelial hyperplasia in the lower part of the cornea. If we move to a more severe dry eye disease, we will get uh, epithelial irregularities. And in severe dry eye disease, we can find that there is a thinning of the epithelium. Uh, if we look at the other parameters, uh, the effect of dry eye disease on other parameters, there are a lot of studies found that there is uh, good uh, repeated measurements uh, and excellent agreement for a lot of measurements, especially the central corneal thickness and uh, other parameters like uh, white to white and other areas. Usually these measurements are not affected 
by, by dry eye disease. And if we look at the corneal aberrations, blood studies also find that there will be increase in the aberrations in the dry eye patients. So to conclude, uh, dry eye disease is an important cause of corneal irregularities, even in asymptomatic patients. Uh, epithelial mapping is a very promising tool that can be used to differentiate uh, such abnormalities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Khaled. It's an amazing presentation. Actually, I learned a lot of, uh, from it. And uh, let's move to the third speaker, who is me. <laughs> OK, so shall I start immediately? Yeah, please. Yeah, you can. OK, thank you. In spite of that, we have one question to Dr. Khaled. There yes. was a staging, if, if, you, if Dr. Mazen allow, a staging of the dry eye, depending on the corneal map, yeah. I think that the 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 coloration it was um because you said the thinning and it was thickening so uh, i don't know whether you were you were uh, yeah, depending in, on in a mild in mild mild dry eye disease at the early stages of the disease there will be a focal areas of thickening of epithelial hyperplasia usually in the lower part of the cornea if we move to a more moderate dry eye disease then the corn the epithelium will get more irregular and you can find areas that are thicker, some areas are thinner. You get an irregular epithelium. And okay. if we move to a more severe dry eye disease, this could lead to uh, epithelial thinning. And this is yes. what is su suggested in the literature, actually. Maybe Dr. Mazin has a better answer than me. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, actually. And uh, just for one comment for the color scale. Actually, the color scale can be adjusted in the mm -hmm. way that you, you would like it to be displayed yes. in. So you That's may have a reversed or... But yes, actually, it was adjusted yes. in reverse. That's why yeah, I, I know yeah. that, but it was adjusted in reverse. But uh, the standard right. one is, as uh, Dr. Khalid mentioned, is mm -hmm. that um, the, the thinner will go to blue yeah. rather yes. than hot. Okay, so let me start. Um, I'm going now to talk very briefly about an entity or a disease that uh, we usually miss mm -hmm. during our clinical practice. And for sure, it has an impact on uh, everything, uh, including cataract surgery, refractive surgery, and the usual treatment of patients with dry eye disease. Now, we all know that there are um, there is plenty of manifestations of the ocular surface diseases, including this long list. But the four major and main categories are dry eye disease, neurotrophic keratopathy, meibomian gland dysfunction, and mebomitis related keratoconjunctivitis, which I'm going to talk about now. Now, mebomitis related conjunctivitis is a disease in the cornea characterized by scar with or without new vascularization. And this scar, this is the second criteria, this scar corresponds to the portion of the lid that the mebomitis is most severe. So the patient usually has mebomitis, but in the area where the mebomitis is most severe, this pathology will happen on the cornea. As we see here on the left side, a small portion, while on the right side, almost the, the whole cornea. Now, this pathology may range from very faint scars with maybe with some vascularization or without vascularization into very profound melting of the cornea and even perforation. So it is just related to mebomitis. There are two types of this disease, the flectinular type and the non-flectinular type. The flectinular type ranges from mild, as you see, to severe. And it is characterized by nodules on the cornea, very similar to Salzman, but associated with vascularization. The non-flectinular type is also characterized by scar or scarring of the cornea with or without uh, vascularization, but there are no nodules but the whole corneal surface is compromised. In a very 
famous uh, study regarding this disease, there were, there were, uh, were two groups, the normal group and the diseased group, a comparison between these two groups. In the normal group, the P acnes were isolated in almost a quarter of the normal group. And the rest, there was no pathogen detected. On the other hand, in the diseased group, the P acnes were isolated in 60% of, uh, of the patients, followed by aureus and followed by epidermidis, while no pathogen was detected in a quarter of the diseased group, which means that the P. acnes should be the first uh, pathogen to think of when we see such a problem. And this leads us to the treatment of this disease. We can use topical and we, as we can use, uh, and we must use systematic, um, uh, systemic, sorry, at the same time including one or a combination of more than one of the following medications. The cephalosporins, the sub-antimicrobial doses of tetracyclines and sub-antimicrobial do microbial doses of macrolides. So we have to use systemic and we have to use topical whenever available. So, to take a take home message, we have to keep the diagnosis of the mebomitis related keratoconjunctivitis in mind. And we have to detect faint scars because sometimes faint scars are not because of herpes virus, as we always say that, okay, very faint superficial scar, maybe the patient had previous herpes virus. No, maybe the patient has mebomitis related conjunctivitis, keratoconjunctivitis. And this disease is very, very aggressive. So we have to treat it aggressively. And thank you very much. I'm on time. Thank you very much, Dr. Mazin. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing now. All right, Dr. Safwan, would you please introduce the second speaker? Yes, just let me open. I think that Victoria uh, Nancy. <clears throat> so uh, the neurotrophic keratopathy. Amal. Amal. Sorry. Amal. Sorry. Amal. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, Dr. Amal or Ekat. Dr. Amal, please. Uh, Stage for you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for your kind uh, introduction. And it's always an honor to be among this gr great group. Um, so today I'm going to talk about neurotrophic mm -hmm. uh, keratopathy. Uh, is uh, my screen um, Can you see the screen yes, now? Yes, we can see okay. your screen very well. Okay. So uh, my name is Amal Lourikat. I'm a cornea refractive surgeon from uh, Jordan. I have no financial interests. So uh, all of us uh, might encounter this uh, kind of uh, corneal ulcers. And it is always, when you see this, you know that this patient will stay a lot and will, you will have a lot of uh, visits and um, uh, it will be a long journey in treating such types of uh, corneal ulcers. So as we all know, neurotrophic keratitis, uh, the whole mark is decreased corneal sensation, decreased or no corneal sensation. There are many uh, causes on top of those comes the herpetic corneal disease, as we all know, the herpes simplex and herpes zoster virus. Any cause uh, of uh, damage to the fifth cranial nerve, history of LASIK, uh, ocular surgeries, uh, any uh, history of contact lens wear, systemic diseases, chronic topical anesthetics or NSAID abuse, some corneal dystrophies, limbal stem cell deficiency. This is a very long list. Uh, so the severity of the neurotrophic keratopathy can be classified according to the MACI classification. 
so the mild case when we have an epithelial, no epithelial defect, but we have a mild punctate keratitis. The moderate is when we have an epithelial defect, but there is no stromal involvement. And then we have the severe stage where we have a corneal ulcer, and if it's not treated well, it will end with scarring or with perforation. So this is a vicious circle. It starts with the impairment of the trigeminal reflexes and uh, the epithelial alteration, impaired healing, decreased tear uh, uh, formation, and then a spontaneous corneal epithelial breakdown. There are many ways to classify or to qu quantify the amount of the uh, decreased corneal sensation. First of all, you should instruct a no-touch visit. Sometimes we have a, a, a technician as a first encounter with the patient. So we should always instruct them when we have a case like this, that there no, uh, we should not have any you know, uh, topical anesthetics applied on the eye because this will affect the, uh, the testing of the corneal sensitivity. There are many ways. We have all the qualitative ways, the cotton swab or WISP. Some uh, doctors use the dental floss and we can use a piece of uh, tissue and uh, the uh, corneal sensation will be uh, described as decreased or absent or intact. We have the Cochet bonnet test, which is a quantitative way. Uh, it has a thread and uh, with a particular length and we can quantify the degree of the corneal sensation according to the length of that thread. Uh, this is not available in every clinic. I used to have this uh, during my fellowship, uh, but uh, it, it is uh, not always available. The other comorbidities that need to be addressed and that might make the diagnosis difficult should be all uh, addressed, dry eye, blepharitis, exposure, keratopathy, uh, topical drug toxicity, mild chemical injury, contact lens related disorders. Those might interfere and may make the treatment even difficult. So as always, we start with the ABCs. We need to add significant lubrication and remove any offending agent any uh, preservative uh, drops should be stopped. And we should always uh, review the bag of the medications because sometimes you might be amazed with what the patient has. And that, uh, you know, sometimes the patient will not tell you about all his drops. So always there is a surprise in the patient bag of medication. Uh, start the antimicrobial uh, as a prophylactic. And uh, if there is a degree of inflammation, we can add topical steroids. We can add topical cyclosporine or uh, doxycycline. So the uh, treatment array is long and starts from the uh, conservative measures and ends with the corneal neurotization. The, a few words about this measurement. It is not available in, in my region, but uh, uh, there is a lot of talks about it. It is uh, the first recombinant human nerve growth factor applied uh, six times daily for six to eight weeks course. And the mechanism is the corneal innervation. It stimulates the regeneration of the, uh, and the survival of the sensory nerves. Uh, there was a study about the uh, efficacy of this measurement. There was two big studies, one in the Europe uh, European and one uh, is the US study. And they concluded that the medication is effective in at least 55% of the patients by week four and up to 70% of the patients by uh, uh, week uh, eight. The side effects were um, minimal. 16% of the patient has an eye pain topic, uh, following the installation. Less than 1% have uh, corneal deposits, foreign body sensation, and uh, increased tearing. So uh, we should have a plan always when we are dealing with a patient with a neurotrophic keratopathy, and we should classify according to the severity, and uh, then we will look at all the options that are available. So the autologous serum tears, uh, it is uh, usually used as a preservative free uh, tear uh, uh, drop, and it contains the growth factors. It is beneficial in neurotrophic keratopathy and also in epithel persistent epithelial defects. There is a risk of infection, so it should be used with an antibiotic. Uh, uh, I will not go over the way of preparation, and it can be used with 25% uh, uh, concentration, 50, 75, or up to 100%. It is divided into uh, uh, many drops and it should be freezed. And then uh, you can uh, instruct the patient to do each vial and use it for two to three days. We do prepare those in our um, uh, hospital. Mm -hmm. 
The amniotic membrane, there are many uh, forms of the amniotic membrane, as you all know. It is uh, composed of a thick basement membrane and a vascular stroma, and it has all the growth factors, the protease inhibitors, and the, uh, uh, it acts as a substrate for the epithelial cell migration. Uh, there are many forms. Uh, there is the fresh frozen, the freeze dried. Then we have the Procura, uh, uh, which is very nice, but the cost is the main issue with this. And we do uh, the freshly prepared uh, amniotic membrane at our, at our hospital. So the, we uh, uh, actually prepare the amniotic membrane from placentas after cesarean section uh, uh, birth and uh, after consenting the mothers and making sure that those are negative for hepatitis and HIV. Uh, uh, this is a small video showing how uh, we prepare and how we retrieve the tissue. This is the appearance of the tissue after uh, cleaning and uh, then we store it for uh, 14 days and we can use it up to 14 days. Uh, we can use it up uh, in a single or a multiple uh, patterns and a stroma up or stroma down according you know, to the indication. We can use contact lenses, bandage contact lenses that will promote the epithelial healing or sometimes the scleral uh, contact lenses that act as or provides a micro, micro environment for the uh, ocular surface. Then also we should address all the, uh, the issues, any problem with the lids, exposure, uh, botulinum, botulinum toxin, tarsurafi, uh, whether temporary or permanent, sometimes even glue, cyanoacrylate glue, to tape you know, the eyelids for 10 days might help. Uh, so those are all the options. And then finally, we have the corneal neurotization. Uh, we don't perform this at our hospital. It can be, it is an endoscopic procedure, epilateral or contralateral, and we dissect the supraorbital nerve uh, branches and insert it into the subconjunctival space. In cases of severe thinning or perforation, we have many options. It's cyanoacrylate glue, multi-layered amniotic membrane. We can uh, also use tectonic or lamellar keratoplasty or penetrating keratoplasty. So in conclusion, neurotrophic keratopathy can lead to a devastating outcome if not controlled early. We should always create a good microenvironment for the healing. And it is a combination of things, removing the offending agents, improving the tear surface and the tear film, topical and then surgical options are all important. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Amal, for the very comprehensive and very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, so would you like to, uh, dear panelists, would you like to stop for two minutes because we have good time? Two minutes before we move? I don't think we have for good time, really. Yeah. Still, we are running like five minutes delayed. Okay. So let's move to the second speaker, Dr. Ahmed Asaf from Egypt. Dr. Ahmed, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Mazin. Let me share my screen. I hope you can see my slides right now. Yes, your slides very clear. Okay. So uh, I'm charged now to talk to you about the impact of dry eye on eye oil calculation. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Mazin Sinjab for his kind invitation, as well as Dr. Safwan Abayati to share in this very uh, prestigious meeting and uh, hope to see you in reality very soon. So yeah. let's start my presentation right now. Uh, as you know that the reflective surfaces of the eye include the precorneal tear film, cornea, crystalline lens, and vitreous. The precorneal tear film is the greatest reflective power and it is the most important reflective media of the eye. And dry eye produce tear film irregularities and optical power changes along the corneal surface. And uh, as you know that the corneal power is a key component in any biometric formula as it, as it determines the power of the spherical IOL. So keratometers uh, rely on good reflections or miles on the corneal surface and unstable tear film will produce irregularities of those miles, and this will compromise the biometry or compromise the measurement of the corneal power with one to one ratio. One diopter error in the measurement of the corneal reading on the corneal surface will result in one diopter of post-operative refraction error. 
And the same applies to optical biometry. Uh, it has the same principles as the optical. All optical biometers shed uh, LED lights on the corneal surface and the camera seeks the brightest spots of these reflections. And the distance between these reflections is determined the corneal radius and hence we can calculate the corneal power. In dry eye disease, uh, the camera cannot identify those bright spots and this will result in error in measurement of the corneal radius and of course error in measurement of the corneal power. In one study, it shows that there is increased variability of the hyperosmolar, of the key readings in hyperosmolar eyes compared to the normal uh, eyes. As you can see, this is in this study, the hyperosmolar eyes in blue, and this is the normal eyes in red. There is uh, increased uh, variability in the key readings in the same eye between two visits more than 0.5 diopters uh, in the hyperosmolar eyes, significantly higher compared to the normal eyes. And this variability were, were up to 3.75 diopters in the same eye between two successive uh, visits. And this is, of course, one of the leading causes of refractive surprise after cataract surgery. And this results in less repeatability and reliability of the measurement of the corneal power uh, in cases of dry eye. And uh, the error is not only in the mean uh, K readings, but also regards the magnitude and the axis of astigmatism, which is known as the vector astigmatism. And the vector astigmatism difference was more than one diopter in 17% of the hyperosmolar eyes in blue, as you can see here, compared to the normal eyes, only 2% in the normal eyes in red. So this is results in the higher incidence of post-residual refractive astigmatism in cases of toric IOL implantation. Uh, uh, again, there is another study that regards the patients, the cataract patients. Cataract patients uh, are, ha are at high risk to get a dry eye because of the age, because of the hormonal changes, uh, some medications like the anti-hypertensive drugs, dietary factors, omega-3 fatty acid deficiency. In one study, it shows that uh, patients coming for biometry prior to cataract surgery, 77% uh, of these patients have positive staining on the ocular surface of any type. And 63% of these patients have tear, uh, have tear breakup time less than five seconds. And the most astonishing fact, fact here that these patients were asymptomatic. They didn't complain of dry eye symptoms. And this was confirmed by another blepharitis study, which showed that around 59% of these patients were having blepharitis of any kind, mainly posterior blepharitis, and 61% of these patients had breakup time less than seven seconds. And again, those patients were asymptomatic. 100 patients, 200 eyes were included in this study, and none of these patients were complaining of dry eye. Why these patients do, do, do not complain of dry eye? It's not clear yet, but Probably the symptoms of dry eye, like foreign body sensation, irritation, dryness, sense of itching, irritation, uh, are masked by the neurotropic component of dry eye. And of course, the cataract will mask the fluctuation of the vision, which is another chief complaint of dry eye uh, uh, disease. So what? We have to suspect dry eye in every cataract patient, look for signs of dry eye on the, in every cataract patient, don't rely on symptoms of dry eye and treat dry eye aggressively before IOL calculation. As you can see, this is suspect dry eye, especially if there is discrepancy between the key reading measurements between different devices. You can see here, the key reading in the corneal topography is almost one diopter, while in the IOL mass is 1.67 diopter. As you can see, again, there is difference in the axis of the corneal cylinder for, of more than 10 degrees, which is clinically significant. Of course, it will have a, a, a great impact on a, a, a toric IOL power uh, planning and calculations, of course. So we have to suspect the dry eye if there is discrepancy between the key readings. You can look for dry eye signs for every cataract patient, especially look at the corneal myers, just for subtle changes of the corneal myers, look for the uh, lead, uh, for mebomian gland dysfunction, do some staining, uh, lysamine green stain or chlorosine staining, or look at the meniscus, tear meniscus height, or if you have the tear film analysis, you will have a more comprehensive data on the ocular surface and the, the quality of the tear film of those patients.
please do not rely on corneal tomography. Corneal tomography is less sensitive to detect dry eye compared to the corneal topography. Topographies are based on reflections, and that's what we are looking for. We are looking for reflections on the corneal surface, not the thickness of the corneal surface, as in tomography. So please rely on topography because it's more sensitive to detect subtle changes on the ocular surface compared to the tomography. And now treat uh, before any preoperative measurements. We have a myriad of options to treat uh, those patients like artificial tears, uh, short courses of topical steroids, topical cyclosporin, systemic tetracycline, IPL, functal occlusions, uh, mechanical exfoliation. We have uh, a lot of uh, options to employ for our patients to have uh, optimized ocular surface before taking the measurements. This is an, another example. One of my patients have been before and after treatment of dry eye for four weeks. You can see a change in the magnitude of the astigmatism and the axis of astigmatism. And of course, it would have an impact on my surgical tending for toric IOL implantation. Please do not instill artificial tears prior to biometry because artificial tears will, will increase the variability of the K readings um, yeah, before uh, biometry. And this effect extends from 30 seconds after installation of the uh, artificial tears and two minutes after installation of the artificial tears. And this applies for the low viscosity artificial tears and high viscosity artificial tears. And as you can see, there is no specific pattern. Sometimes the care reading is increasing, sometimes the care reading is decreasing so that you cannot even predict how much change it will occur after installation of the uh, artificial tears uh, before taking the K readings. And this effect is extended up to five minutes before until the K readings goes back to those basic uh, readings before in, uh, installation of the artificial eye drops. And in some literature, it said it's extended more than five or maybe 10 or 15 minutes after installation of the artificial eye drops. So please make sure that before taking any biometry measurements or any K reading measurements that the patient did not install artificial eye drops or or even anti-glaucoma medications, eye drops, at least 10 minutes prior to biometry measurements. So to summarize, dry eye disease is a common in cataract age group. Most of these patients are asymptomatic. It must be suspected in all cataract patients. It significantly influences the K reading uh, measurement. And of course, it affects the power calculation and the surgical planning in cases of toric IOL and should be addressed prior to biometry, not before the cataract surgery, prior to any measurements on the corneal surface. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. As usual, very nice slides, <laughs> very nice presentation. Comprehensive, a, a very, yeah. very important, comprehensive, very interested. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much. Khitam Mohamisk, Dr. Ashraf. Dr. Safwan, would you please introduce uh, Dr. Ashraf? So Dr. Ashraf, he will, he will uh, give us, um, uh, Dr. Ashraf, he's with us. Yeah. Dr. Ashraf, yeah. So he's impact us, of, yes. uh, in treatment of a patient with a glaucoma. Yes, Dr. Ashraf. Uh, thank you, Dr. Safwan, Dr. Mazin for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to, I'm not a glaucoma specialist, but I see a lot of uh, OSD uh, in patients uh, with glaucoma. Yeah. So I have no financial disclosure about my presentation, but these are my financial disclosures. Uh, uh, we, cannot you know, see your, we cannot see your uh, screen. Uh, would you please share? Okay. Maybe Dr. Ahmed is not stopping, stop sharing. Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Asa. Ahmed would you please stop sharing? I already okay. stopped my, uh, share my screen. Yeah. I don't share my screen. Okay. It's okay now? Yeah. Yes, we can see. Okay. Uh, so I have no funds to go, but this I'm a financial disclosure. As we all know that glaucoma is a chronic progressive optic neuropathy and most uh, significant risk factor for developing glaucoma, and it is progressive uh, progression of the elevated intraocular pressure. So this means that topical intraocular lowering uh, eye drops are the first line of therapy for glaucoma and most patients requiring treatment throughout their life. And also we are known that is a leading cause of visual impairment. So the disease is characterized by progressive alteration in the optic nerve. So according to Kegley and Broman, they will, there will be 79.6 million people around 2020 uh, all over the world. So if we look, 
we are going to find that ocular surface disease and hyperemia are the most common adverse events of topical ocular medication because of the preservative. While active components may, may cause allergic reaction or irritation, preservatives which are intended to prevent the bacterial growth are more toxic for the eye. So all over the world now, most recent glaucoma medications no longer contain preservatives. Despite this, Low, a local tolerability may still impact treatment compliance and patient quality. But the etiology seems to be multifactorial and is influenced by age, SNC, sex of the patient, and may be associated with other disorders of the anterior segment, such as blepharitis, allergies, and dry eye. So the OSD is also linked to the chronic use of ocular intraocular pressure lowering therapies. And this is how we will see most of the glaucoma, uh, long glaucoma chronic patients on the set lamp. The clinical presenta presentation includes ocular dryness, irritation, burning, lacrimation, foreign body sensation, red eye, and blurred vision. And Bafa et al. have already demonstrated that the tear film and the ocular surface are altered in patients using anti glaucoma medication. And it is also known that both active principle of the ocular hypotensive eye drops and the preservative used, usually the benzene chlorium chloride, which is the most important, can cause or activate the changes in the ocular surface. And Stewart also showed that in the OSD in glaucoma patients, 42% nearly have this OSD, and this percentage appear to increase when the number of the glaucoma drugs prescribed more and more from one drug to two, three per day. So this will aggravate the OSD. And also the very important, it's not just the, drug, the OSD, it's also the quality of life. Numerous studies in the literature have shown that the presence of OSD in patients with glaucoma affect the patient quality of life and may influence therapeutic appeal. If he, if he if found himself, he cannot put the drug, he's going to stop the drug because he, he found that his quality of life is interrupted. In this table, between the, comparing between the control group and the glaucoma group, you can see how is the keratitis and the conjunctival hyperemia and the breakup time is in the control group less than in the glaucoma group. And also the keratograph uh, analysis between the glaucoma and the control, how the tear meniscus and the redness and the mebonography and the breakup time are more or less and is aggravated in the glaucoma group. You can see it here in the uh, tear meniscus, how you can see the tear meniscus well seen in the control group and in, uh, in the glaucoma group, how you lost the tear meniscus. And also how you see the bulbar redness in the glaucoma, and this is the control group, how it is better. And also you can see the difference between pre-treatment and post-treatment. In the upper part is the pre-treatment and the eye looks perfect in the lower treatment lower groups. And this is the scaling of the uh, Mebius scale, which is a very important range from zero degree to, to degree four. And it depends on 0% loss up to 75% loss of the marble. And you can see how it looks in the pictures. And this is compared between also a control group and the glaucoma group. The myoglobin gland dysfunction is a major cause of dry eye. It's important to evaluate the myography to establish the correction between the myoglobin gland loss and the OSD. And you see here how it is full number of the myoglobin gland, and here are loss of the myoglobin gland in cases of chronic active, uh, chronic on uh, glaucoma patients. And also in this table, you can see how it differentiation between the pre-treatment and the post-treatment in the best corrective visual uh, equity in the right and left. And you, have, you see how the difference is more uh, more improved post-treatment, and also the bulbar redness and the and the fluorescein, how it is improved in the treatment is more, and in the uh, post-treatment is totally improved. So most of the studies found that the patient with glaucoma had a higher prevalence of OSD criteria than the control group, including worsening the conjunctival hyperemia and all the symptoms like the bulbar redness and the tear break and the meniscus height. And the glaucoma affect millions around the world and topical uh, glaucoma uh, drugs may impact ne negatively on the patient ocular surface and symptoms. And, and very important to highlight this for the glaucoma experts, they must 
take care of the OSD beside to treat the glaucoma patients. And the preservative drug, it is very important. Indeed, it's unfortunately that some countries does not have the preservative free medication of glaucoma, but it is a very mandatory to use. So my home take message, as a glaucoma is a chronic and side-threatening disease, glaucoma treatment demands lifetime management and strict compliance. So intensive ocular surface treatment of glaucoma patients under topical treatment may improve clinical parameters, symptoms, including IP. Since the preservative has been shown to harm the ocular surface, avoiding or minimizing the preserved exposure may result in further improvement of ocular surface. But all the studies nowadays shown that the detailed characterization of the OSD related to glaucoma eye drops and the positive impact on the comprehensive ocular surface raising concerns and important awareness, both in the glaucoma and the ocular surface uh, practices. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. It was a very interesting uh, uh, lecture that showed us how much that um, as a preservative material that we are using with the patients with the, uh, having the glaucoma can affect the ocular surface disease. And uh, in my question is that, uh, uh, the issues is that when we are discovering patients with a glaucoma that having already existing ocular surface disease, you can imagine how they are suffering from adding any uh, anti-glaucoma drops. And that's why in those patients that they are presenting with already with, with a grade one or grade two dry eye disease, I'm starting always with the preservative free. So great thanks for, for you and the, the, the talk now to, to Dr. Mazin to finish the, the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Safwan. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf, for the nice uh, uh, conclusion of the session. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers. Um, it was a great session, actually, about ocular surface disease updates in diagnosis and treatment. Uh, thank you all. Thanks for the audience for being with us. And uh, we hope to see you physically in the future. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.